Section 3 of Hero Tales from American History. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Tramco, Bismarck, North Dakota. Hero Tales from American History by Henry Cabot Lodge and Theodore Roosevelt. Section 3. George Rogers Clark and the Conquest of the Northwest. Have the elder races halted? Do they droop and end their lesson, wearied over there beyond the seas? We take up the task eternal and the burden and the lesson. Pioneers, O oh pioneers, all the past we leave behind. We debouch upon a newer, mightier world, varied world. Fresh and strong the world we seize, world of labor and the march. Pioneers, O oh pioneers, we detachments steady throwing, down the edges, through the passes, up the mountains steep, conquering, holding, daring, venturing, as we go to the unknown ways, pioneers, O oh pioneers. The sachem blowing the smoke first towards the sun and then towards the earth, the drama of the scalp dance enacted with painted faces and guttural exclamations, the setting out of the war party, the long and stealthy march, the single file, the swinging hatchets, the surprise and slaughter of enemies. By Whitman In 1776, when independence was declared, the United States included only the 13 original states on the seaboard. With exception of a few hunters, there were no white men west of the Allegheny Mountains, and there was not even an American hunter in the great country out of which we have since made the states of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin. All this region north of the Ohio River then formed part of the province of Quebec. It was a wilderness of forests and prairies teeming with game and inhabited by many warlike tribes of Indians. Here and there through it were dotted quaint little towns of French Creoles, the most important being Detroit, Vincennes on the Wabash, and Kaskaskia and Cahokia on the Illinois. These French villages were ruled by British officers commanding small bodies of regular soldiers or Tory rangers and Creole partisans. The towns were completely in the power of the British government. None of the American states had actual possession of a foot of property in the Northwestern Territory. The Northwest was acquired in the midst of the Revolution only by armed conquest, and if it had not been so acquired, it would have remained a part of the British Dominion of Canada. The man to whom this conquest was due was a famous backwards leader, a mighty hunter, a noted Indian fighter, George Rogers Clark. He was a very strong man with light hair and blue eyes. He was of good Virginian family. Early in his youth, he embarked on the adventurous career of a backward surveyor, exactly as Washington and so many other young Virginians of spirit did at that period. He traveled out to Kentucky soon after it was founded by Boone and lived there for a year, either at the stations or camping by himself in the woods, surveying, hunting, and making war against the Indians like any other settler, but all the time his mind was bent on vaster schemes than were dreamed of by the men around him. He had his spies out in the Northwestern Territory, and became convinced that with a small force of resolute backwoodsmen, he could conquer it for the United States. When he went back to Virginia, Governor Patrick Henry entered heartily into Clark's schemes and gave him authority to fit out a force for his purpose. In 1778, after encountering endless difficulties and delays, he finally raised 150 backwoods riflemen. In May, they started down the Ohio in flatboats to undertake the allotted task. They drifted and rowed downstream to the falls of the Ohio, where Clark founded a log hamlet, which has since become the great city of Louisville. Here he halted for some days and was joined by 50 or 60 volunteers. But a number of the men deserted, and when, after an eclipse of the sun, Clark again pushed off to go down with the current, his force was but 160 riflemen. All, however, were men on whom he could depend, men well used to frontier warfare. They were tall, stalwart backwoodsmen, 
clad in the hunting shirt and leggings that formed the national dress of their kind and armed with the distinctive weapon of the backwoods the long-barreled small-bore rifle before reaching the mississippi the little flotilla landed and clark led his men northward against the illinois towns in one of them kakaskia dwelt the british commander of the entire district up to detroit the small garrison and the creole militia taken together outnumbered clark's force and they were in close alliance with the indians round about clark was anxious to take the town by surprise and avoid bloodshed as he believed he could win over the creoles to the american side marching cautiously by night and generally hiding by day he came to the outskirts of the little village on the evening of july fourth and lay in the woods near by until after nightfall fortune favored him that evening the officers of the garrison had given a great ball to the mirth-loving creoles and almost the entire population of the village had gathered in the fort where the dance was held while the revelry was at its height clark and his tall backwoodsmen treading silently through the darkness came into the town surprised the sentries and surrounded the fort without causing any alarm all the british and french capable of bearing arms were gathered in the fort to take part in or look on at the merrymaking when his men were posted clark walked boldly forward through the open door and leaning against the wall looked at the dancers as they whirled around in the light of the flaring torches for some moments no one noticed him then an indian who had been lying with his chin on his hand looked carefully over the gaunt figure of the stranger sprang to his feet and uttered the wild war whoop immediately the dancing ceased and the men ran to and fro in confusion but clark stepping forward bade them be at their ease but to remember that henceforth they danced under the flag of the united states and not under that of great britain the surprise was complete and no resistance was attempted for twenty-four hours the creoles were in abject terror then clark summoned their chief men together and explained that he came as their ally and not as their foe and that if they would join with him they should be citizens of the american republic and treated in all respects on an equality with their comrades the creoles caring little for the british and rather fickle of nature accepted the proposition with joy and with the most enthusiastic loyalty toward clark not only that but sending messengers to their kinsmen on the wabash they persuaded the people of vincennes likewise to cast off their allegiance to the british king and to hoist the american flag so far clark had conquered with greater ease than he had dared to hope but when the news reached the british governor hamilton at detroit he at once prepared to reconquer the land he had much greater forces at his command than clark had and in the fall of that year he came down to Vincennes by stream and portage in a great fleet of canoes bearing five hundred fighting men british regulars french partisans and indians the vincennes creoles refused to fight against the british and the american officer who had been sent thither by clark had no alternative but to surrender if hamilton had then pushed on and struck clark in illinois having more than treble clark's force he could hardly have failed to win the victory but the season was late and the journey so difficult that he did not believe it could be taken accordingly he disbanded the indians and sent some of his troops back to detroit announcing that when spring came he would march against clark in illinois if clark in turn had awaited the blow he would have surely met defeat but he was a greater man than his antagonists and he did what the other deemed impossible finding that hamilton had sent home some of his troops and dispersed all his indians clark realized that his chance was to strike before hamilton's soldiers assembled again in the spring accordingly he gathered together the pick of his men together with a few creoles one hundred and seventy all told and set out for vincennes at first the journey was easy enough for they passed along the snowy illinois prairies broken by great reaches of lofty woods they killed elk buffalo and deer for food there being no difficulty in getting all they wanted to eat and at night they built huge fires by which to sleep and feasted like indian war dancers as clark said in his report but when in the middle of february they reached the drowned lands of the wabash where the ice had just broken up and everything was flooded the difficulty seemed almost insuperable and the march became painful and laborious to a degree 
all day long the troops waded in the icy water and at night they could with difficulty find some little hillock on which to sleep only clark's indomitable courage and cheerfulness kept the party in heart and enabled them to persevere however persevere they did and at last on february twenty third they came in sight of the town of vincennes they captured a creole who was out shooting ducks and from him learned that their approach was utterly unsuspected and that there were many indians in town clark was now in some doubt as to how to make his fight the british regulars dwelt in a small fort at one end of the town where they had two light guns but clark feared lest if he made a sudden night attack the townspeople and indians would from sheer fright turn against him he accordingly arranged just before he himself marched in to send in the captured duck hunter conveying a warning to the indians and the creoles that he was about to attack the town but that his only quarrel was with the british and that if the other inhabitants would stay in their own homes they would not be molested sending the duck hunter ahead clark took up his march and entered the town just after nightfall the news conveyed by the released hunter astounded the townspeople and they talked it over eagerly and were in doubt what to do the indians not knowing how great might be the force that would assail the town at once took refuge in the neighboring woods while the creoles retired to their own houses the british knew nothing of what had happened until the americans had actually entered the streets of the little village rushing forward clark's men soon penned the regulars within their fort where they kept them surrounded all night the next day a party of indian warriors who in the british interests had been ravaging the settlements of kentucky arrived and entered the town ignorant that the americans had captured it marching boldly forward to the fort they suddenly found it beleaguered and before they could flee they were seized by the backwoodsmen in their belts they carried the scalps of the slain settlers the savages were taken red-handed and the american frontiersmen were in no mood to show mercy all the indians were tomahawked in sight of the fort for some time the british defended themselves well but at length their guns were disabled all of the gunners being picked off by the backwoods marksmen and finally the garrison dared not so much as appear at a porthole so deadly was the fire from the long rifles under such circumstances hamilton was forced to surrender no attempt was afterward made to molest the americans in the land they had won and upon the conclusion of peace the northwest which had been conquered by clark became part of the united states <laughs>